Hi, everyone. My name is Carol Ann. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm from Ethereal Encounters Unveiled. I hope this finds you all well. Today, we're going to be welcoming Dr. Bo Kirkwood. He is the author of A Purpose Driven God. And I read this book from cover to cover. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think you're all going to enjoy the conversation based off of this book. Dr. Kirkwood wrote this book and he asks in it and answers a lot of questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Do I have purpose and meaning to my life? Where am I going? And why is there something and not nothing? And I'm sure all of us have asked those types of questions at some point in our lives or every day of our lives. And I think you're really going to find this conversation to answer some of those questions in a way where you can discover your own truth. That's what we're all about here. A little bit about Dr. Bo Kirkwood. He's a retired family physician. He most recently served as a hospice doctor for Heart to Heart Hospital Hospice in uh, Southeast Texas. And he graduated from the University of Houston with a bachelor's degree, got his doctorate degree, his medical degrees. He's got so many degrees and worked for so many different universities. And of course, I'm going to let him speak to that a little bit more. Um, he has many, many interests, uh, particularly in Christian uh, apologetics and intelligent design. He's also lectured on these topics for many years, and that's what's given him the authority and know-how to write such a book. He's also the author of three other books, Unveiling the Da Vinci Code, The Evolution Delusion, and this one, The Purpose Driven God. And he also co-authored books with his brothers. And of course, I will have the links to where you can um, get all of these books below in where the discussion is. And of course, be sure to ask any questions that you may have after you hear our conversation today. And I will make sure that they get to Dr. Bo so that he can hopefully answer them for you. So please, while you're here, be sure to subscribe and like this video. I would greatly appreciate it if you do. Of course, as you know, it helps with algorithm when you do that. So please do subscribe. Thank you again so much for joining. And with that, I welcome Dr. Bo Kirkwood. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I said in our intro, we have Dr. Bo Kirkwood with us today, and I'm very excited to speak with him um, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about his new book, A Purpose Driven God. We have a lot of questions to ask. Of course, we're not going to be able to you know, ask them all, um, but we're going to get to a lot of the core questions. So Dr. Bo, um, give the folks just a basic background of who you are, a little bit about your book and why we're here today. Okay. Well, I grew up in Houston, Texas, went to high school here, and also went to the University of Houston, then went to medical school. Uh, before medical school, I worked for my family doctor, who was a Christian, who was also a very good uh, physician. When I got through with my internship, I came back to Pasadena and uh, worked with him for a few months, and then he retired, and I was left with a solo practice for quite a few years and practiced family practice in Pasadena for 36 and a half years. Towards the end of that time, I also did hospice work. And then when I retired from family practice, I moved to uh, Navasota, Texas, which is just south of College Station. Continue to do the hospice work. Uh, but I've also always had an interest in uh, cosmology, where we came from, who we are, that sort of thing. Uh, I grew up in a Christian world and I was exposed to Christian apologetics early on. And then when the intelligent design movement started you know, 20 years ago, or whenever that was, uh, I, I got excited about that because now we had not just Christians uh, proclaiming that there has to be a God, but you had scientists that were now on board with it. And they sought to prove the existence of God uh, through scientific methods. And so I've been studying that for a long time. I've taught classes. I've given lectures on, on apologetics, but primarily about cosmology and uh, the universe, how things came together and how there has to be an order. Well, there is an order to the universe and it's exquisitely designed and 
that's really a, a, a concept that's not really debated, the, the, the design of the universe. The more important question is, uh, is the design apparent or is it real? Is there really something behind that? And that's why I, I wrote my book. I wanted to show from a scientific point of view that there's evidence for a intelligent being behind uh, the universe for the creation of the universe. And then towards the end of my book, as you've read, I believe I can identify who that is, at least from my perspective, from a Christian point of view. Um, and what I'm doing in my book is fulfilling what the, the Apostle Peter says in his letter, uh, given a, giving an answer for what I believe. He says that you should be able to answer someone as to why you believe what you believe. In essence, that's what this book is about. It's giving an answer, both from a scientific point of view and from a spiritual point of view, uh, what I believe and, and the evidence that I have for that. That sounds excellent. Um, we have so many questions to ask you, but what, what's the thesis statement? So basically, you kind of just went over it, but so you, you're trying to answer um, what's the purpose of, of our lives? Why are we here? And many of us always ask ourselves that question, like, are we here just to prepare for, for our afterlife? Does what we do here matter? You know, those types of questions. And as I mentioned to you before, it even goes into the mathematics of the universe and how the universe is, is based on math. And, and, and that chapter was very interesting, a little above my learning curve, but, but very, very interesting indeed. So Let's just get started. Um, so what do you mean in the book by a worldview? Well, there are multiple worldviews, but there are two primary worldviews. You either believe that the universe uh, and we as individual uh, human beings uh, came about by random chance. We would call that, I would call that a materialistic worldview a natural materialism, there's different words for it, methodological materialism, but it's just that by chance and chance alone, the universe uh, came into being. And then as a result, through uh, billions of years of time, uh, animals came into being, and then eventually human beings uh, 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 existed, but again, by random chance and chance alone. And then there's the theistic uh, worldview. And the theistic worldview says that there's an intelligence behind it that I call him God. You may call him something else. Other people may, may call it something else. But there is an intelligence behind the universe. And the proof for that is, like we mentioned earlier, is in the, the exquisite design behind the universe. And so you have those two worldviews, and everyone uh, has that worldview, whether they realize it or not. People don't generally walk around thinking about their worldview, but they have a worldview, whether they can articulate it or not, they, they have a worldview. And the consequences of the worldview, if you have a theistic worldview, there is no purpose a lot. I mean, we're just here, we're uh, eat, drink, and be merry, I guess you could say. There is no purpose for our existence. There is no afterlife. Uh, when, we, when we die, it's all over. And as a result, there is no accountability for what we do on earth uh, we it, there is no accountability and that has a that has very significant consequences which i'm sure we'll get into as we proceed but if if you hold that worldview and i'm not saying all materialistics but uh, materialists uh, are evil people i'm not saying that at all mm -hmm. but the basic of that uh, philosophy or that worldview is there is no accountability that gives some people comfort they say well then you can live your life without any uh, angst are worried about karma or something like that because there's nothing after this. Whereas the theistic revel, uh, worldview at least sort of implies that there is something hereafter, that there is a spiritual side to man that uh, exists once we are gone, and hence there very possibly could be some accountability, and that we do have purpose. We have multiple purposes, but we we, we have purpose on this earth, and um uh, that gives me more satisfaction than the idea that there's no purpose at all. Right. Uh, what is the worldview when someone believes in intelligent design, but they also believe in evolution and they believe that God is responsible for evolution? How does that fit into worldview? 
Well, that's uh, I would call that a that's still a theistic worldview because you believe you believe there's a God, but that He caused uh, us to become uh, animals and and human beings to come into existence through an evolutionary process. Uh, the the word for that is theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. I don't hold that worldview. And the reason I don't hold that worldview is there's just no scientific evidence for theistic evolution or for evolution at all. And when I talk about evolution, I'm talking about uh, I separate the macro from the micro. Macro evolution is what most people mean when they say evolution. And it's the idea of molecules to man. We came about again by random chance and then everything evolved thereafter. You know, Darwin's theory of evolution does a reasonably good job of explaining how species change, but they don't, he doesn't do a good job at all of explaining how species got here. Well, right. microevolution, which I do believe in, is how each species changes and adapts. I would use the word adaptation a lot of times for microevolution, and that's a fact. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute. And I really don't know too many people that would dispute that. But there's the theistic evolution that I don't believe in, but that's still a theistic worldview. Mm, true. In your book, you ask a very poignant question about materialism. And you can't help but think about materialism more now than ever. Um, but does seeking pleasure and avoiding pain and living lives that are like devoid of consequence produce anything good? I, I don't think so, personally. I, I think if you look at what... Uh, however you define good, if you look at good that's produced, it doesn't generally come from a materialistic point of view. And in fact, a lot of bad things occur as a result of that. And we talk about the 20th century, how uh, probably the 20th century was the worst century uh, in human history when it comes to uh, uh, evil things that were done to people. And we can point to a lot of it, but beginning probably probably with World War II and then or World War I, excuse me, and then going into World War II and the Holocaust to Stalin's regime, to Mao's regime. Those were all materialistic regimes and materialistic ideas uh, and uh, didn't produce anything good from my, from my point of view. Whereas someone that believes in purpose, and if one of those purposes, which I firmly believe, is to help our fellow man, uh, the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have do unto you, that produces good. That produces good things such as hospitals and and, and other things too. Uh, I wouldn't say that materialists haven't produced things that are good. I wouldn't wouldn't say that. But the majority of the good that we see in this in this world comes more from a religious point of view. Now the critics are going to argue there's bad things that have happened in the name of religion, and I would not deny that. But if you were to put them on a scale of religious atrocities versus the evil that's been done from a materialistic point of view, it, it's not even close. But what about something like, is it Maslow's hierarchy where, you know, once you get all of your needs fulfilled, then you can really start to become like a more spiritual person and, and at least be able to be in the mindset to, to ask these types of questions, because if you're starving and you don't have a, roof over your head it's kind of tough to be spiritual and ask these types of questions so materialism is kind of good i think well not having your materialistic needs met so that you can be in a place to ask these types of questions no well i think there's there's two different ways of using that word materialism the materialism can also mean like you're talking about the uh, uh, food and and, and, right. and pleasurable things right. and uh, that's a different way of using the word materialism but certainly yeah when you're starving and you have no food on the table it very well may be hard to think about spiritual things i think that's the very time when we need to think about uh, spiritual things um i didn't grow up in a rich environment but i didn't grow up in an environment like the third world either and most of us in this country haven't right but um the 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 those that are downtrodden are the people that we most definitely need to help uh, but they should be the ones also that would be looking to i think a spiritual uh viewpoint of life as well right why do you think that humans need to be taught to be kind i don't think this is my point of view my opinion 
but I don't think being kind is necessarily a, a natural thing. I think kindness comes from above. Whether you believe in the, the New Testament or, or not, uh, still, I think that 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 uh, uh, the morality that is placed in us does not come from within us. It comes from without us. It comes from it comes from God. And a, a young child or, or, or a younger individual isn't necessarily kind just because they are born kind. They need to be taught that. They need to be taught to uh, to share. They need to be taught to uh, to to help their uh, their their playmates or their brothers or sisters or, or whoever. I think that's a thing that has to be taught. It's taught from their parents and the parents get them from their parents. But also I think ultimately uh, our morality comes from God because materialism doesn't produce by nature morality. Uh, there's moral relativism. You want to use that word, but moral relative, relativism only says that society determines what's right and wrong. That sounds good on the surface, but it has very significant uh, consequences when you start letting society and society alone determine what's moral and what's not. What you wind up in is a Third Reich, like uh, happened in Germany during the uh, uh, Adolf Hitler regime, where you have society now determining right or wrong. And we, have, we see it today, you know, even in politics, uh, when we determine what to vote on is what's right or wrong is what the majority feels is right or wrong. That has serious consequences, in my opinion. I think morality comes from God. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just trying to kind of play the flip side of the coin here. Sure. So if, if you look at like cavemen back in like Neanderthal man, don't you think that um, maybe they discovered or knew that kindness was essential to their survival, sharing food, helping build, you know, huts to live in. I mean, and there was no biblical reason for them to do that back then. I mean, don't you think well, it, it kind of had to do with like a survival thing? No. Well, if, and I, from my point of view, no, it doesn't. And I'll tell you why. Survival of the fittest. Explain. Darwin doesn't really do a very good job, and neither does anybody else, telling me why the survival of the fittest has anything to do more than my own personal survival. Uh, if I am a particular animal, for, exist, for example, why do I care that another animal of my species survives or not? I'm I'm concerned about why I or how I survive. Uh, and from a human standpoint, without morality, that it's the same thing. Why would I care why other people around me survive or not, unless it's inbred into me, or unless there is a moral co code that I think comes from above into, into the hearts of man, even before the Bible? Obviously, people were living along before the Old Testament was ever written. Right. Uh, uh, Neanderthal, in my opinion, was man, by the way. I, I don't believe in that progression of man from uh, caveman to modern man. I believe there were were there were uh, apes and chimpanzees and so forth, but they were not and did not progress to mankind. Neanderthal, I believe, was just uh, an, an early form of man. But I think, and this is my opinion, I think the morality issue was put in the hearts of man from the very beginning. By God. And that's why we're made in the image of God. That's not, we don't, uh, the Bible doesn't say any other animals are, quote, made in the image of God. Well, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It doesn't mean that God looks like me or you, that he has, uh, he or she has two eyes and two arms and two legs and a brain and that sort of thing. I don't believe that at all. I think the morality uh, part of it is that image of God, and that was placed there by God. And the spiritual aspects of man are also how we are made in the image of man. And then it goes back to what I discuss in my book, the mathematics and the order of the universe. That all goes back to a mind, and that mind is God. And in that sense, we're given minds as well. We're given minds so that we can explore the universe. And in that sense, I think we're made in the image of God. How does that account for an atheist having uh, a high moral code? Uh, I think it's a, a bit of a paradox for them. Uh, they can have a high moral code, and they do. Many of them do have a high moral code. I would have to ask them that question. Mm. It doesn't account for it. It's not evolution, in my opinion. Evolution doesn't account for that, because no. evolution time is about the survival of the fittest, and it's about my own personal uh, survival. 
And so uh, evolution doesn't explain it, but that's a very good question to ask, but it's a question to ask them. And I don't know uh, the precise way, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins would come up with some sort of evolutionary theory like the selfish gene and other things like that to try to show why there's morality, but it's to me just storytelling and there's no proof for it whatsoever. Yeah, because they they even claim that like altruism is not authentic either. Um, and that like, we, you know, we're, we're conscious beings, not spiritual beings, but I guess that's a whole nother conversation. You're right. That's another conversation. I, I mentioned it briefly in my book when I talk about uh, the ants and so forth, right, you know, right. where you have, where you have the ants that want the colony to survive. But uh, Dawkins would go, he would go all the way back to the ant kingdom to show that there's a gene for the survival of the species and not just the individual. Uh, there happens to be no evidence of that uh, from a scientific point of view. It's conjecture. So not even relating to our innate ability to want to survive. You're saying that there's no genetic predisposition to that. Not in my opinion, no. Not in your opinion. No. No, I think uh, the, 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 the will to survive is certainly genetic, but as far as the, the morality, no. not from not. I don't think that's a genetic thing at all. I think that's so, a spiritual thing. Yeah, no, I, I happen to agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it always perplexes me about the good and evil thing. Um, if if evil is on the planet, which it is, definitely. No doubt. No, no doubt. doubt. <laughs> um, and Lucifer, it has been. Right. It has been. <laughs> right, absolutely. And Lucifer is a fallen angel. Um. It's funny because I've had I've had this conversation with so many other people and I still can't get the answer that comforts me. Okay. Um, I ask. It, it's, so, it's probably one of the most difficult questions. It is. Absolutely. That you can answer. Why is there good? Why is there evil? Right. I, I will let you finish your question, but I think I know where you're going with it. Go yeah, ahead. Like, why didn't God just kill Lucifer? Like, why didn't he just instead of making him prince of the domain? of earth. I mean, I know we have free will and there's that whole thing, but in your estimation, why do you think that we still have to struggle that battle between good and evil? I, I think you mentioned it. It's the free will. Now we were made with free will. We had the choice to commit sin or not to sin. If you want to use the word good versus evil, we have the choice to do good. We have the choice to do evil. Could God have created us as uh, animatrons or, or, or robots? He certainly, he or she could have. But what good would that have done him? Why would he have done that? The glory of God, I believe, comes from creating uh, 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 people, creating uh, uh, beings that have the capacity for our free will. And that was his decision to do that. That free will also gives us the, the free will to love. You know, when you think about it, if we were just uh, robots, that that wouldn't be there either. And so by free will, I believe that's where bad things come about, because by my free will, I choose to do things that are, are not good. I don't know how all that worked in the in before time began for human beings, when there was a spiritual world and a spiritual world only. But uh, like you alluded to, angels, Lucifer included, seem to be created beings. They are spiritual beings, and it would also seem from the Bible and from, from what we can infer that there were those that chose to disobey God. They were created with free will as well. They could have chose to, to uh, stay in the heavenly realm with God or not, and for whatever reason, uh, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, whatever word you want to call it, plus his demons chose not to do that, and I believe they're real. And the evil that we see perpetuated on this earth today is propagated by him. But why God chose not to destroy Lucifer immediately, he did not. I believe the book of Revelation says that he will be destroyed. Him and his demons will be destroyed in the end, but they're, they're loose now. And it doesn't take much, as you mentioned, to look around our world, uh, even look in your own backyard and see where the evil is being perpetuated. It's, you know, the Fortunately, it doesn't predominate in our society, but it's certainly uh, it's certainly there. It's always been there. 
Uh, as I said, the 20th century was probably the worst century on history of evil being done. Uh, the 21st century seems to be starting off a little better, but not much. But we're only a third of the way into it, and we are even a fourth of the way into it. And who knows what's going to happen by the end of this century. But we see, you know, look at the evil that's going on right now, both in Israel and, and in the Ukraine and in parts of uh, uh, Africa. Uh, and again, even in our backyard, Houston, which is my backyard, Chicago, L.A., uh, New York, you name it. Uh, evil people doing evil things. But they have free will. And if materialism were true, if you think about this from a logical standpoint, if materialism was, is true, there is no free will. There cannot be any free will. If every function that I have in my body is a biochemical reaction, then I'm predetermined what I'm going to do, what you're going to do, and there is no such thing as free will. Now, it's amazing that those people use their free will, the materialist, will use his or her free will to try to convince you that there isn't a free will, but that's what they have to believe. Because if we're, if everything's materialistic, there is no free will. That may not give people a lot of comfort, but to me, it's at least an answer. And why bad things happen to good people, I don't think God's doing that. I don't right. think that, I think that's part of creation. And creation started deteriorating almost the time God created it with, with the fall of mankind. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think he's directing that someone gets cancer or that some young child gets in a car. I don't believe that, but it happens. And the bottom line is it all happens basically due to free will. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So let's talk about um, something that a lot of people talk about, and it's still in the huge topic in the, especially with the large Hadron Collider, what's going on over there with CERN, you know, the singularity, the big bang, how does that fit into your beliefs about, a purpose-driven God. Do you think he's responsible for that? Do you think it happened? Do you think it's just a science, like science and scientists made it up? Like no, it's not uh, really. Th there, there, there's evidence that the universe had a beginning. Okay. Now that hasn't always been scientists for most of mankind's existence. When science started, did not believe that they believed in what is called a, uh, a steady state uh, condition where Everything existed from the beginning. Well, uh, Fred Hubble came along and saw that the universe was expanding through the Doppler effect through his telescope. What an expanding universe implies, and that's due to the redshift, and we can talk about that a little bit. That gets a little bit sci sciencey, if you will. Mm -hmm. But because there's an expanding universe, that means the universe, therefore, had a beginning. To me, that points to a God, not away from a God. And in fact, the physicists such as uh, Stephen Hawking and others, uh, Penrose and others that came up with the Big Bang idea and or perpetuated it and did mathematics to try to prove it, realized they had a problem once they discovered the Big Bang, and that is that the universe had a beginning. Well, what always has a beginning generally has a cause. That's the cosmological argument, right. uh, the right. problem argument that Daniel Craig likes to, uh, likes to talk about. And so whether you call it a big bang or a big something, I don't care. <laughs> a, a, a big something happened. And whether it's the big bang or something else, uh, I, I don't know. But there seems to be evidence that the singularity is when there was basically nothing and then bam, it explodes. And we have the universe in 10 to the minus 43 seconds or so forth. It expands to, to uh, tremendous uh, uh, lengths and in spaces and space uh, and time then were created and matter were created at that singularity. Now what the scientists will say, Stephen Hawking in particular, what happened before the Big Bang is not scientific. That's where I believe God comes in. So the singularity of the Big Bang is saying that something came from nothing, essentially, uh, right? I mean, that to be time, time, energy, and matter were so compacted. We still have the problem then, okay, how does that happen? How does something come from nothing? Exactly. They, would say time, they would say time, energy, and space were all compacted into a small, infinitesimally small diameter uh, um, that 
And what caused it then to quote unquote explode and have the big bang? They can't answer that either. Right. Uh, so they have a they have a problem there. Either matter existed or something came forever, or matter or or uh, or matter had to exist forever. And the theory now is now they've come up now with this idea of inflationary multi-universe theory that says that there's that uh, the mathematics of the world could have produced the 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 universe. Mathematics itself, quantum fluctuations is the term that is used for where something came from nothing. Well, you still don't have something coming from nothing, do you? When you have that, you have quantum fluctuations. Tell me where, if that's true, and I don't think it is, but if it's true, then where did quantum fluctuations come from? You're back, you're back to that, that same point in time again, in my opinion. Do you think that quantum theory changed um, the science community's perspectives on God? Do you think it impacted their beliefs? Uh, that's a hard one to answer. I, I'm not sure. I think it certainly it changed Albert Einstein's view of the universe when, when quantum, uh, quantum mechanics came about. He was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, but when the uncertainty principle was, was uh, generated by Weiner uh, uh, Heisenberg, uh, where it says you can't know the, the precise velocity and the space of a particle at the same time, there's a certain uncertainty about the universe. Uh, Einstein was reported to have said he didn't believe that, so he used the term that God doesn't play with dice, and he rejected quantum theory at that point. And so I don't know if he went to his death, deathbed holding that view or not, but quantum mechanics to me is still, um, it still needs to be developed more. All I right. think it's a real phenomenon. And the duality of, 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 uh, uh, of energy, the duality of light, the duality of particles being both a wave and a particle, uh, electricity, for example, the electron being both a wave and, and a particle, that's part of life. And we've been able to do tremendous things with quantum theory. But because of the uncertainty principle, it's left a lot of people shaking their head. It's got some, some uh, ideas that... that don't necessarily follow what would be my rational uh, rational point of view or rational rational thought because of because of that uncertainty principle. But that, has it caused someone to become more or less religious? I don't I don't know that answer. What about the unifying theory of everything that um, like string theory? I mean, we just seem to be making all of these advances in science, and I I. I get the feeling that these scientists are being more drawn into the fact that there is a purpose-driven universe and it's God. Well, there are more and more scientists going that way now. I right. do believe that's true. And the intelligent design community, I believe, has had a, a reason for that. And the reason we've been looking for a uniform theory, and I'm not a, I'm not a physicist. I'm a physician, mm -hmm. a doctor. I, I do have some background in biology. That was my major in, in college and in, but uh, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a physicist, but from what I've read, the problem with both uh, 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 string, th not string theory, but quantum theory and relativity, which are the two major principles that the universe is governed by, relativity and quantum theory. Mm -hmm. The mathematics that works for relativity doesn't work for quantum theory or quantum mechanics. And the mathematics that works for quantum mechanics doesn't work for relativity. There's a problem there. Einstein was looking for what you call that unified theory. Physicists are still looking for that unified theory. String theory is an attempt to do that, to kind of merge quantum theory and relativity together. But there's a lot of problems with string theory. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's far from a proven theory. It's way far from a, th a proven th theory. One of the problems I mentioned in my book is that for string theory to be true, there apparently has to be more than four dimensions. There has to be at least 10. And in some, and I uh, read that. some, some permutations of string theory, there has to be 26 dimensions. Oh, that's, a, that's hard to, to, to get your hand around. Mm -hmm. And then in my book, I mentioned chaos as a, as a theory as well. Well, I don't think chaos theory is necessarily on the par with relativity and quantum theory, but it does make you wonder about why there seems to be chaos, yet out of that chaos comes order, and it 
it, it's still being developed as well. Chaos theory is 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 a developing theory as well. Some scientists would call it a non-theory. They don't right. put it on the par with scientific theory. But it, it uh, I, I mentioned it in my book because I think there's more to be learned about chaos theory. What about entropy? Like everything decays and, you know, humans, the planets, the universe, like how, how do you see that fit into a purpose-driven God? Do you think we're just all born to die and in between what we do matters? Like, is that preparing us for our afterlife? What's your whole take on that? That's a good question. I haven't been answered, asked that question before. Uh, by the way, your questions are all very good. Thank it's, you. It's, it's clear that you've read my book. Some of yes. my interviews I've done so, so far, they've read the, uh, the, they've read the uh, press release, but not the book. Oh, no, uh, entropy, I read the whole thing. <laughs> I know you did. I can tell. Uh, entropy is one of the mega laws. You know, we look at the mega laws of the universe and the laws of thermodynamics. Entropy is one of them. And entropy is about order and disorder. And the universe tends to be going towards disorder. And right. we've done experiment after experiment to show that life now seems to contradict that because how did life come about? And I've asked that question before to scientists. They don't have a very good answer. Sean Carroll, who's a very good scientist, an astrophysicist or a physicist out of Caltech, I believe, um, very bright individual. He at least makes an attempt to try to answer that question. Uh, how does life come about if everything is going uh, uh, is tending towards disorder because life to me looks to be very ordered. It's a very ordered thing. Now, once we're born, we decay as we get born, but to get life to, to get started. And he says life is an intermediary. He compares, believe it or not, he compares life to a cup of coffee that you pour cream in. And when you pour cream in your coffee, it, it, at first it looks, it's got different colors and, and different shades, but eventually it all turn a light brown color. Well, that's life. We are just, uh, we, we're an intermediary stage. And the purpose of life is actually to perpetuate entropy. Not a very satisfying answer, in, in my opinion. To me, life does seem to contradict the mega law of, of entropy. But I don't think it contradicts God's law. I think God put those mega laws that we're still discovering. Like we say, we're still looking for that unifying theory. We're still discovering those mega laws, but that seems to be a mega law and nothing yet that I know of has ever really contradicted that with the exception of possibly life of that mega law. But uh, I don't think it changes uh, 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 the existence of God or not. I just think that's a law that he put in place, just like he put uh, the law of, gravity and the law of, uh, of electromagnetic force and so forth, all that came into place at the very beginning of space and time, which the scientists would call that singularity you alluded to. Right, right, right. God obviously wants us to know these things. I mean, we're intelligent beings. Um, he wants us to understand science and mathematics and everything. But yet, we still never get close to discovering the essential answers to those questions. Why am I here? What's my purpose? Do you think that we're getting closer to finding that out? Because if you look at like today's society, um, there seems to be a, a big movement growing back towards Christianity. A lot of people are getting rebaptized or baptized. People are discovering this spiritual nature they're coming to terms with the fact that they're not just bodies, they're, li they're spirits living in a, in a body experiencing the world. I believe you're right. Yeah, I believe you're right. Um, I think there are answers to those questions, by the way, as why I'm yeah. not here, what my purpose is. Yes, ma'am. And But if you think you're going to find it without any help or through the scientific world, the answer is no. Science doesn't have an answer to those questions. That's in the very beginning of my book, as you as you read. If you, they don't like those why questions. Uh, they're they're beyond them. Uh, they don't like them at all. And that's why Stephen Hawking would say that. But what happened before the singularity is not something that we can know the answer to. But why am I here and what's my purpose? I think has been delineated in God's word. That's the end of my book. And how do I have proof for that? Well. The proof of that to me comes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. If uh, you believe that Jesus Christ was real, and there's plenty of evidence that he walked on the earth. Now, those that want to deny that Jesus was ever on the earth, uh, uh, they have to deny a lot of history. I'm talking about secular history, not right. just history from the Bible, but secular history as well. So he walked on the earth. The big question is, was the resurrection a real thing, or was it the figment of somebody's multiple people's imagination? Well, uh, there's many witnesses that the, the Apostle Paul talks about seeing Jesus after he was resurrected. He had a bodily resurrection. That proved his divinity, if that, in fact, happened. Well, I wasn't there. You weren't there. No one was there. We have to rely on those eyewitnesses' account. Were they accurate or were they not accurate? I would try to prove their accuracy by, sh by, by sharing that many of those people, and certainly most of the apostles, except for maybe the apostle John, uh, were crucified or became martyrs for what they believed, and they all saw the resurrected Christ. If the over 500 people that also possibly died at the hands uh, uh, of the Roman government died believing they saw the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and, he, and it didn't happen, then they died for believing in an illusion. And that doesn't make sense to me. They died believing that they had actually saw the bodily resurrection, and some of them saw the ascension of Jesus Christ. Once you've proven that, then the Bible becomes very important, because Jesus certainly quoted from the Septuagint in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and we have uh, proof by Jesus that he was the Son of God when he walked on earth by the miracles that he did, and those were attested to as well. But the biggest miracle is the resurrection. And then the Bible will tell you what our purpose is. And that's, again, the point of my book. Our purpose, number one, is to glorify God. And we don't glorify God by doing evil. What happened uh, on October the, what was it, 7th or 11th in, in Israel was not bringing glory to God. I promise you, what's going on there now? isn't bringing glory to God. None of that's bringing glory to God. But there's a secondary purpose, and Jesus talks about that when he was asked what the two greatest commandments were. The one was, as you probably know, and I, most of my viewers, our viewers will know, that is to, to, to obey God, to believe God. But the second one is to treat my fellow man as I would want to be treated as myself. And, and those are the two biggest purposes, in my opinion, for us being here. Now, we have a purpose to our family. We have a purpose to ourselves as far as what good we can do and as far as survival is concerned. But I believe our purpose is delineated in, in, the, in the New Testament. It's just that people don't want to know that. They don't want to say, well, that's too concrete. That, 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 it's, got to be, it's got to be more than that. Um, and then again, in my book, I talk about the book, The Swerve, which is a, a, a good book. I uh, uh, read the book by Stephen Greenblatt. He, he derives comfort in thinking that there is no purpose to life, and th therefore we don't need to worry about how we live our lives because there's no accountability as a result. Well, the Bible says there is an accountability, and my purpose is predicated on that accountability. I remember, like, back in college, you know, reading, like, learning pre-Socratic um, philosophy, and they've been asking these questions back then, Socrates, oh, Plato, and prior to that. Um, do you, what do you think has changed in today's society that either, like I said before, a lot of people are turning to Jesus and spirituality. I, I don't want to conflate the two because spirituality can be very different than. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes, ma'am. It's like two two different things, but but people do call it becoming more spiritual too. Um, so why do you think that there is such like a dichotomy between people that are are like doing this spirituality craze where they're practicing witchery and Satanism and you see it in our music, you see it on TV and movies, and they're just out there with it. They have like no qualms about telling you exactly what, you know, what they, and yet you have the other side that is growing more towards um, getting rebaptized and and following the church and believing that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Why do you think that still remains from like eons ago? 
Well, I think what's going on now is people are looking for some sort of answer. Unfortunately, they're looking for answers a lot of times in the wrong places and going to things like you just talked about. Uh, they they put more the, the the Roman letter and Paul would say they are worshiping the cre creature mm. or the creation rather than the creator. Mm. And so we have the Pia societies, excuse me, Glia societies, where we have Mother Earth. And that we need to do everything we can to save Mother Earth. I'm not right. downplaying the importance of uh, uh, of the, the, uh, the climate change and so forth. I'm not a kook. I believe that the Earth's getting warmer and all that. I'm not downplaying that. But that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to save the Earth, so to speak. I think by being good stewards of the Earth as Christians, we will do those things. Right. That, will, right. that, that will be a, a natural reaction to those things. Uh, and so they're looking for something. They're they're looking for uh, they're looking for their purpose, and, and they're looking at it, looking for it in the wrong places. Other people are seeing the evil that finally is obvious, and you know we're hidden from it a lot. Of, we're hidden from it. We don't. It's not in our face a lot of times. But now with the videos and, and so yeah. forth, and seeing the, the people can can take instantly pictures of evil that's going on. We're starting to see it. They're looking for answers. And I think they're starting to understand that the answer lies in something higher than ourselves. And the most logical conclusion to that, to me, and again, that hence the reason for the book, is God and the God of the Old and New Testament, not the God of pantheism or the God of, of Buddhism, because Buddha didn't die and, and 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 become resurrected. Neither did Muhammad. Neither did in neither did Confucius. The only one in history that did that that was that died that was raised again, not to die again, was Jesus Christ. And his resurrection confirms that. And I think people are starting to look for that more and more. And uh, now I believe the intelligent design people have helped along that way too, uh, to show the the reasons why we believe there has to be a God. But there's a lot of good people in Buddhism do, doing good things. Oh, I'm not I saying mean, that. How do you no. account for that? Like, what do you think happens to to them at the end of of their days? You know, I don't know. Yeah, I, it's, I would it's not, really I would not, perplexing. I would not. Uh, I would not even attempt to become uh, the judge over over people's uh, lives or right. people's spirit after this life is over. I believe what I believe. But there's a lot of what if questions. What about the good moral person that was never exposed to the word of Christ? Exactly. What about them? And the answer to that is, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think the mercy of God, the grace of God covers a lot of things. But I do believe that if I'm taught the right thing uh, and I ignore it, I think that's on me. But yeah. um Oh, I'm not saying that that, that Buddhist. Or, I hope that's not what I meant by. Well, no, no, yeah, no, no, no. That was very clear. They're, they're not evil people. No, no, I, no. Of course. I think. I think. I think, uh, the, I think the truth. Jesus said, "I am the truth. I am the way, and no one comes to the Father except by I mean, right. No one else. Not not Buddhas. Not Confucius. And certainly not any of these other uh, spirit, so-called spiritual leaders. Yeah. I, I mean, I would imagine that if you're even even with the atheist, if you're leading a moral good life where you're doing the things that God, Jesus wants us to do, I would I would like to believe personally that at the end it would account for something. I like, would too. Right. I don't know it will. <laughs> and we won't and we won't know that we will. But I have some I, I'm not going to get too personal here, but I have some loved ones that fall into that category. Right. Most moral people you will ever meet on the earth. The kindest people you will ever meet on the earth. But they don't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. That's they've been exposed to that. They've been taught that. They just don't personally believe that. How is that going to account for them in the uh, the end? I do not know. I'm going to leave that up to someone higher, higher yes. than me. But Yes, I think we all want to believe what you want to believe. And I do believe that the New Testament and Jesus himself taught um, uh, after life, there are, there are levels of accountability. There's a, if you want to use the word punishment, okay, you just use the word punishment. There, there, are the, there are levels, and that comes in the parable about the, the stripes, the many stripes or the fewer stripes. Um, but how that all comes out on the end, I don't know. And, you know, the thing about we talked about materialism and, and theism 
if I'm right, I'm going to know, and so is the so is the atheist. If the atheist right is right, neither one of us are going to know. That's right. Life is over when you think about that. It, it's, That's so it's, true. If I'm right, I'm I will know that at the end, and so will the atheist. Right. And Jesus does say at the end, every knee is going to bow. Right. So they, he's talking about at the resurrection, at the day of judgment. That's every knee. Not, not just the Christian knee. Every knee will bow because then it will be obvious. If I'm right, if the Bible's right, and I believe that to be true, in the end, every knee will bow. Do you believe in the Antichrist? I believe the Antichrist has been around for a long time. And are they still here? Absolutely. Uh, the book of John talks about uh, the Antichrist is one, and we, we've mentioned it already, uh, are those that did not believe that Christ came in the flesh. That was the Antichrist. And that spirit of the Antichrist, if you, if you read uh, the, the, uh, the, the books of John, John 1, 2, and 3, where it talks about the Antichrist, that spirit of the Antichrist was around when John wrote, wrote those epistles. It was already around. Do I believe that there's the coming of the Antichrist? No, I don't, I, I, like most people do. Uh, with the 1066 and so forth. Most of the book of Revelation was written uh, regarding what was going on to those Christians at the time, and it, and it was written in figurative language, and it was dealing with persecutions and tribulations that were carried out by the Roman government, and the Roman government, Diocletian in particular, but other emperors as well, proclaimed themselves to be God. They were antichrist. They were anti-God, and they were around at that time. But are the antichrists percolating and circulating around now? Yes, there were, and yes, there are. And I do believe at the end of times, and when that is, I don't think any of us knows, but at the end of the times, uh, Lucifer, Satan, is going to be loosed for a while, and things will get a whole lot worse then than they are now. They're already pretty bad, but... Uh, but I don't believe, uh, you know, like the, the movies and the books, The Omen and so forth, that, uh, that there is an antichrist that is going to rule on this earth like, like those books talk about. Interesting. But the, the antichrist is around, and it's been around for two millennium. Because I've been reading so much about uh, the signs of the antichrist, like in the forehead and the hand, and now we have microchip brains and microchips in our hands. So it just seems everything to, seems to be very indicative of that, that maybe that is the Antichrist. Maybe it's not a being. Maybe it's AI. Who knows? Like, Maybe. I don't know. I believe the 666 represents a number that is less than perfect. Seven is always a perfect number. Mm -hmm. And when you use the word 666, you're just emphasizing less than perfect, three, you know, a, a cubed, if you will, uh, three, three times. And so the, that's why that number is used in the book of Revelation. That's what it symbolizes. And that Antichrist is a, a less than perfect, severe, significantly less than perfect uh, individual. But there's no doubt Satan is, um, and I don't, don't mean by what I said a minute ago, that, that Satan and, and, and evil is not already in the world. As I've already said, it clearly, it clearly is. But I believe there's going to be a time where it might get worse. You want to call that the Antichrist? I don't have a problem with that, but the idea that there's that one individual, because throughout history, there's a, there's been many antichrists. I mean, oh, yeah, you can go back to, Absolutely. I guess, uh, Adolf Hitler, for example. I, I, I'm a World War history, a World War II history buff. I've read and I've watched a lot of that. And I, I remember as a kid, my parents talking about that Adolf Hitler was supposed to have been that antichrist. Well, he's dead and gone. And he, is uh, the Third Reich fizzled out, and it's not raining for a thousand years, so it clearly couldn't have been him. But was he Antichrist? Yes. Yeah. He was not, he yeah. Was. Well, some people think the Antichrist comes, you know, like throughout time. Like I've heard even Napoleon mentioned as oh, yeah. the Antichrist. So, I mean, who knows? You're right. I I don't know. I you always hear the mark of the beast will have a six 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 on his head or forehead or whatever, and I, I don't know. I, all I know is for good reading exist. and good entertainment, but I, I believe that right. the, the problem with the book of Revelation and the interpretation of the book of Revelation, which is possibly the most difficult book uh, yes, to interpret, yes. you have to begin at the very beginning. And it begins by saying these are signs that should shortly take place. It was, it was written primarily to first century 
uh, Christians. Now, does it talk about heaven and, and the afterlife? Yes, of course, the book of Revelation does. So I'm not saying the whole book is written strictly for them, but that book was written for our learning too, but it was primarily written to first century Christians. And it was said these signs are things that should shortly come about. And I think most of that came about during that first and second century when the Christians were being uh, severely persecuted. Now, in the end, the Roman government, as we know, in, right. when, uh, in, in 325, accepted Christianity. But long before that, the Roman government was did its best to try to squelch Christianity. And in fact, by doing that, they didn't squelch it. They, they fertilized it, if you want to use that word. Right. Christianity right. developed in spite of, of, of that. What about, I wanted to ask you about, um, just to step away from science for a second, what about um, near-death experiences, NDEs? They, they, they've been around for decades, but the past like five to 10 years, there's such conversation going on about them and the people that have experienced them are deeply religious, believe, you know, Jesus is their Lord and Savior like I do. But these things have transformed people's lives. These NDEs. They have. Uh, Tell us they, your, your take on well, that. As a physician, I've actually had some patients that have experienced that. I've been a part of people that when I was an intern as well, that we resuscitated that were, if you want to use the word clinically dead for a, a few minutes, were clinically dead for a few minutes. And I mentioned that in my book as well. Uh, there's, again, those are popular things too. They're hard to explain without believing that there has to be something that goes beyond outside our bodies. The ones that are the, the most difficult to explain from a, and I'm talking about explain from a scientific point of view, are the ones that can tell you precisely things that were going on uh, in the room while they were dead. And one that become that, uh, that I read about in particular was a individual that supposedly died and left her body went above the hospital and saw the top of the hospital where her body was still laying and saw a red shoe at the top of the hospital. And sure enough, when they they revived her and she told that story, they went up there and there was a red tennis shoe at the store. Those are real stories. And almost everyone, and I would, I would use the caveat, almost everyone that has had a near-death experience, it's a, not an unpleasant experience. They come back believing more and more. If they were believers before they had the experience, their belief is actually uh, helped by that. They, they become stronger, stronger believers. There are some, though, that, that don't have that same experience where it's very, very dark. And that's, right. a, that's a small percentage. I think they're real experiences. I think they're evidence that there's something more than our material body. But I can also say in my book, I would believe in a spiritual body regardless of those experiences that individuals have had. But I think it points to, and maybe that's one way God is trying to tell us that there is more to this life by those experiences. And of course, with the technology that we have now, we'll be reading and hearing about more and more of those experiences as time goes on. Uh, I would have liked to have been around at the time of Jesus when Lazarus was resurrected, wouldn't you? And I would have liked to have asked him what it was like those three days he had been in the grave. Uh, Bible doesn't record that, by the way. Bible doesn't record it. But what the Bible does record is apparently the Apostle Paul had an out-of-body experience. And he went to what he called the third heaven. I think that, that was a real experience. I don't think it was a dream that he had. But what did Paul say about that when he was describing it? He, he said he wasn't allowed to say what he saw. He couldn't talk about it. So he didn't. He talked about having the experience, but he didn't tell us what that experience was. And I think out of death, and maybe that happened one time when Paul was, Paul was persecuted many times, almost done to death. He was stoned to death and left for dead several times. He was bit, beaten almost to death several times, and maybe it was one of those times he had that experience. I don't know, but I think those experiences are real. That helps. And I, again, I've had patients that have come back, uh, have been resuscitated, and they have a positive view from that point on. They're not afraid of death. One of the key things that you see, um, again, almost 100%, but not quite, is that almost all those individuals um, have no fear of death. In the book, I'm going to blank on the name, 90, 
Minutes in Heaven or whatever, written by a Baptist minister here in Houston that died in a car wreck. You read that book, and he has no fear of death whatsoever, and I believe him. In fact, he wished he had stayed there. Yes. His, in his book, he talks about having the feeling of sadness when he was brought back. Yes, and most most of them do. Most of yeah. them don't want to come back. They they you know, but they they have a purpose as they're told. I think that gives them even more yeah. purpose. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that was incredible. I, I mean, I have so many more questions from your book that I would love to ask you. Maybe we could do a follow up some sometime in the future because I, I highly recommend everybody read this because I think it will change their perspective on, because I always thought there were never going to be answers to those essential core questions. You know, why am I here? And of course, as you get older, that changes, your perspective changes. But this brings a lot of clarity and it's a very unifying thing I found for me. It kind of pieces together stuff that I didn't think about before. So thank you for writing this. And of course, I'll have the link to where folks can pick this up on Amazon. Where else is this sold? They're basically sold through the through the internet. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. There's multiple other sites uh, uh, that you can go to in order, but those would be the the two most uh, popular, most common, yeah, most, yeah. most popular, the most common ones that 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 you can go. And I'll be glad to come back and and answer more questions and delve into more topics if, if oh, you want to. I, have, I, I would love to. I, I have so many. I love talk, I love talking about this stuff in case you haven't noticed. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> this is like everything. This is great. But and I don't know if, 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 if there's some way that the viewers uh, can submit questions uh, ahead of time, we could even read some of those and, and try to answer those as well. It's funny you mentioned that because in my little preamble, I had mentioned to them to please leave questions in the comments and I can email them to you or we can schedule them for another you know, Q and A thing that would be awesome as well. And and you know I'm not, not I'm not arrogant enough to believe I have all the answers. Well, I don't have all the answers, but I will tell you this much: people are worried about how science might be trying to disprove God, and and I think why you're seeing more scientists at least get to the intelligent design part. They may not have gotten to the Christian part, but they've got to the intelligent design part, and that's because as more and more science is done. The exquisite, and we didn't really get into this today, but the exquisite tuning of the universe and the, desi the design of the universe and, and biology and the importance of mathematics becomes even more obvious, becomes more obvious. So the, there's no time in our history that there's more scientific proof for a God than there is right now in our century. And I strongly believe that. I do too. I happen to agree with you. In closing... What what else, what are you working on next? I mean, I would love to know. Are you working on another book? You certainly wrote a few. You have three books now, right? And then you co-authored some books. I co-authored one with my with my two brothers who are also physicians, Dr. Ron and Dr. John Kirkwood, and that has to do with uh, Christian ethics and medical science. A little short book, probably needs to be updated. And if I'm working on anything, that's probably what it is. That uh, that needs to be expanded. Uh, my first book I wrote was Unveiling the Da Vinci Code. It had to deal with uh, Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code. After I read it, I knew that a lot of it was a lot of nonsense. I felt compelled to answer it, so I wrote a book about it. Uh, and then the other book was similar to this, but more deals with evolution, uh, and that was called The Evolution Delusion. Uh, and in that book, we deal with some of the same things, but really more about uh, how evolution is a delusion. There's just no scientific evidence for evolution. Again, something we didn't talk a, a lot a lot about here. But if you're going to have a theory that is now most of the scientific world accepts, it ought to be a theory that makes more sense than than evolution. And there's just very little scientific evidence for it. So that was the, the purpose for that book. Oh, I'm but, gonna have to grab a copy of those as well. If I get to work in too quick on another book, my wife will probably shoot me, by the way. Because she, if without her, I couldn't have written this book. Uh, I was wonderful. not, I was not technically savvy as as uh, she is, and she she did a lot to help me get this book out. That's brilliant. That's beautiful. And of Thanks. course, I'll have the links, like I said, in the description of this video. So, folks, post any questions you have for Doctor Bo, and I'm sure we will get together again in the future. And because I I still have a a lot of questions that 
that I want to go over with you from here. So I thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I will be in touch again soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bo.